Hello and uh, welcome back. Um, you've now read through the first part of Act 1 and this video is now going to take you through um, this part in more detail. Now this Act establishes the main themes and motifs um, of lack of freedom, importance of social rules, succumbing to social pressures, uh, deceit, manipulation, in, in particular we see um, hysteria, reputation, uh, power and authority. And these ideas run throughout the whole play. And so it's important that the opening of a play establishes uh, these, um, these ideas. Um, and it in indicates the outcome of the play. It also successfully introduces the main characters who play important roles in the future of the village in the trials that take place. It also sets up the next act of the play in which we see the disconnected relationship between Proctor and his wife Elizabeth uh, as it provides a reason for the lack of love between the two characters. But for now we are only, only going to focus on the first part of this act uh, and the characters that come into play here. Okay, so let's look at this first page um, of the play. We are introduced to the character Paris and we see uh, him straight away uh, weeping and praying. So like I said in my previous video, the action is, is, uh, is happening now in front of us and we are, um, we are sort of stumbling in upon a scene that's already taken place. We see that Paris is aggressive and places a high degree of importance on the way in which society perceives him. Uh, he, as such he is continually afraid to have his image tarnished. He believed he was being persecuted wherever he went, despite his best efforts to win people and God to his side. This quotation reveals Paris's lack of confidence and makes him seem paranoid about the way in which others perceive him. Um, and by always talking about uh, him, himself, his reputation, his name, his career, um, Arthur Miller is giving us that impression. It also shows that Paris is constantly trying to gain the favour of others. A really um, bad situation to be in when you are a leader. Uh, this reveals his need to be accepted as part of a society and the fact that he is unable to stand alone and isolated from the other members of society. Um, we see this really clearly uh, at the opening here. He, he mumbles and seems about to weep, then he weeps, then prays again. This image of Reverend Paris weeping at the bed because his daughter is sick seems to create the impression that he truly cares about his daughter. However, um, it is possible that he is more afraid about what will happen if she does not wake up. Uh, as rumours of witchcraft being involved in her sickness have already been circulating the bridge and, um, and we get this idea when um, we hear that everyone's uh, milling around in the parlour downstairs, so everyone's come and from the village to find out what's going on. So this fear seems to be motivating um, Paris's reactions uh, and decisions. Now let's have a look at um, how the action continues. Um, interestingly, when Tichiba arrives here, um, it says her slave sense has warned her that as always, trouble in this house eventually lands on her back. Uh, we are, are witnessing a scene that is already heightened and there's already an underlying sense of fear in the characters. Everyone is afraid of their, their position. 
Everyone is afraid that um, something is going to happen that means that they're going to be thrown out or cast aside or uh, thrown into jail or even killed. Everyone is living in constant fear. There seems to be no sense of um, a firm grounding and permanency in who they are in this village. Um, so everyone is, is always on walking on eggshells. So when we see Paris's first line out of here, um, it seems like a real overreaction to his servant coming in. It's, an, it's, it's heightened and it's a lot of emotion. Um, we, we can see that through the use of the um, exclamation, the exclamation mark there, and also the fact that it begins with a verb. And when you're using those imperatives, it gives you a sense of urgency and that you are taking a commanding and uh, instructive tone. And then Paris's uh, fury continues, out of my sight, out of my, and then he's overcome with sobs. So without the context, we are not certain as to what's going on. Why is he so overcome with emotion? Why is he so angry at Tichaba? What is happening? So we can see that there is action occurring straight away. We, we dive straight into the action um, and we have to almost, as an audience, we're playing catch up to find out what's going on. Um, we, we see uh, Paris's obsession with his, his reputation and his stance in the town when he, um, he says, oh my God, help me, help me. And so see how he's just, he's focused on himself first before he then spares a thought for, for Betty which could indicate to us how precarious his situation is. Um, and then now we meet Abigail. So Abigail is, as we know and have discovered quite quickly, she is manipulative and she's malicious. Um, and she's also seen as a real seductress and temptress. Now, um, this is open to interpretation. And I think it's really easy for a lot of people to put Abigail in that role uh, because it, it, it means that we don't have to empathize with her and her situation. But I think more and more now people are, are trying to create more of an understanding about Abigail and what she does and why she does it. And we don't have to see her as the seductress because often what we do when we look at women in those, in those ways is that if a woman is sexual and if she uses um, her sexuality to um, attract people, to, to attract men and, and to have relationships and to use it as a, a form of power and control, then automatically we assume that she is bad and she is evil. Any, and especially in, in, this day, in, a, in this day of the play, any woman who was sexual was evil and seen as bad. Um, you had to be pious and innocent um, and, you know, and pure. And when you weren't um, adhering to that, um, that image, then you were considered to be um, sinful and you were cast to the, to the outskirts of society. But in a, in a world where women had very little power and authority, where they had very little education and status, um, wealth, uh, possessions, there wasn't a lot that they had that where they could actually um, have take charge of their own lives. So we need to, to not uh, be too quick to judge Abigail based on, on that part of her, but we can't um, ignore the fact that she is manipulative, that she does use violence to control other people, and she does use um, relationships um, to control people. Um, but that could, you know, but that is because she's very clever and she understands her situation and she understands how she can use those things to her advantage. So it's interesting to see that in the, the notes, 
the stage directions, it tells us that she's a strikingly beautiful girl with an endless capacity for dissembling, which means she is constantly lying. Um, the first description of Abigail when she enters the play here sets her up as a duplicitous character, foreshadowing the fact that she plays a key role in the trials that are seen later in the play. So we, we are, um, as the audience, we are working out Abigail here and working out what we think. Um, when she speaks to Paris, we are given that context, uncle. So now we see that she is um, part of the family, but she's also yeah, subservient to him. The action continues to move forward when Susanna Walker walks in. So remember when I talked about structure and exits and entrances um, on stage, create the tension, increase or decrease the tension. And at this point, the, the tension and the, and the action builds when the character Susanna walks in. Um, when she makes reference to the fact that she's come from the doctor um, and he said that he cannot discover no medicine for it in his books, um, we are now curious to work out to find out what's happening, what's going on, um, and, and that straight away um, is an, an allusion to uh, superstition and the spiritual world. Interesting to see Paris's reaction here when he says, uh, no, no, there be no unnatural cause here. Um, tell him I have sent for uh, Reverend Hale Beverly and Mr. Hale will surely confirm that. Let him look to medicine and put all thought of unnatural causes here. Put out all thought of unnatural cause here. There be none. Okay, he's been very certain to repeat that denial. So this quotation shows the extent to which social pressure controls Paris, as we see that he seems afraid of witchcraft being associated with his family and with his daughter. Further seen in the latter parts of this act when he says, how can it be the devil? Why would he choose my house to strike? We have all manner of licentious people in the village. So why me? I'm holy. I'm pure. Um, you know, do it to the people who are really sinful and bad. So this really emphasizes um, his, his feet of being linked with the devil and his fear, sorry, of being linked with the devil and linked with witchcraft. Because remember, witches were servants uh, of the devil. Uh, it's interesting also to see the, the subtle irony here. So he says, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's not, you know, um, think that this is unnatural. Now, it's a real contradiction because if he didn't think that um, witchcraft was at, at all at play here, he would not have sent for the reverend. So his actions uh, belie his words. And we are meant to pick up on that. We're meant to pick up on the hypocrisy. Um, he does actually suspect, I think, that there's something dodgy going on here. He is jumping to conclusions. He is thinking that there's witchcraft involved. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent for the reverend. Um, or is he sending for the reverend because he wants to look like he um, is doing the right thing? So is he saying all this to protect himself or because he actually believes it? What do you think? Um, he's really been quite definite um, when we see that through his language put out, okay, look to, okay, there be quite definite high modality language there. Um, he speaks with, with someone uh, in the position of authority. When Susanna leaves, they re repeat to her to speak nothing of, of this speak nothing of unnatural causes. There's a real fear of gossip um, in the town. Gossip and rumours, they understand the what the town is like, they understand, you know, obviously because everyone's downstairs waiting to find out what's going on. So there's a real fear that um, as soon as that gets out, witchcraft gets out, it's going to be really hard to control and exactly what we see. Um, 
And then this, this part here, um, where Paris turns to Abigail, what shall I say to them that my daughter and my niece are discovered dancing like heathen in the forest? So it, interesting at this point here, things um, it, get a little bit more interesting. So we have a, more information here. We find out that they are dancing in the forest. Uh, uh, and so it's slowly more information is revealed bit by bit. Um, what we need to pay attention to is Abigail's denial. We did dance, okay, but Betty's not witched, okay. She's not witched. Abigail, I think, suspects uh, that Betty's putting it on. She doesn't believe at all in this pretense of Betty being unwell and, and being, you know, in, in a trance, the devil's got her soul, all of that stuff. Abigail's very uh, common sense attitude takes place here. Um, and we need to see that and see how definite she is, just like Paris, very definite, um, so that it's more um, interesting when it all changes. Um, and, and obviously Paris does not trust her. She, he knows more about this than he's letting on. And he also, I think, um, has a mistrust in Abigail. He doesn't really fully uh, trust her and what she says. And, and that gives us an impression that there's things that have happened in the past. Um, so he wants to know the truth because he needs to prepare himself for the, the imminent onslaught of the gossips um, and his, the factions. Um, interestingly that he refers to her as a child, even though she's 17 years old. Um, real uh, interesting attitudes towards children here. There's a real clear distinction between an adult and a child, and there's a sense of authority, a natural authority given to adults and parents, uh, and children are to be um, subservient to that. Uh, and when he, um, when Paris talks to Abigail, we find out more about his enemies. So he needs to know what's going on because my enemies will know and they will ruin me with it. And just as I talked about before, he is um, fixated on this. He is motivated by his own self-preservation. And this also signifies to us that things are not what they appear, um, that there are some tensions and, and conflicts in this town. Okay, let's move on. Uh, interestingly, here, uh, when Paris says, my enemies, um, he says, my enemies will bring it out. And Abigail, do you, understand that I have many enemies. Uh, it's interesting because it, it, it makes us think about who these people are. Uh, and for me, it's a real contradiction in the type of people in this town because this is a, this is a religious community. This is, these are people who, who confess to be Bible believing, God fearing people. Um, and so they, they shouldn't be behaving in this way. There shouldn't be enemies. There shouldn't be people living in fear. Um, and so this, for me, highlights a uh, real hypocrisy that I think Arthur Miller is trying to suggest uh, here. And, and that's constantly reinforced by the fact that Paris constantly is focusing on himself and his reputation and doesn't really say, show a genuine fear in the, um, the health of his child. Um, and this part here, we are getting more information about what went on in the forest. Um, so he talks, refers to them as abominations. See that real um, heightened language as well. Um, abominations are done in the forest. He makes it sound really evil, really satanic, really unmentionable. Um, that sort of it's also euphemism. He can't quite say at this point what he saw. And then Abigail, again, it was sport, Uncle. She doesn't feel the need to um, come 
script, you know, to be truthful at this point, she's just playing it down. Uh, but he is not convinced and he talks about how I saw Tichiba doing this and I heard screeching and gibberish coming from her mouth. You can see how, um, how Tichiba uh, is represented in the play. The, um, someone who is from a, uh, a different country um, is given this representation of being um, being weird and strange um, and she's the the implication of her because she's black she must know witchcraft and um, you know she must do dabble in the dark arts and she's you know she was swaying all of these are very sort of typical ideas of uh, of the dark arts of being a witch um, Abigail replies she always sings her Barbados songs and so that makes us think that this has happened before. More information again comes out. I saw a dress. Um, I thought I saw someone naked running through the trees and so this is starting to sound more um, more dark uh, I guess, more um, significant that something is this all sounds like it's sort of getting worse and worse as more of the details unfold. Um, Abigail is desperately trying to be innocent uh, and naive about this, about these actions, about what, what happened. Um, and so she's starting to get a little bit afraid because she he saw more than what she I think suspects that he did see and so now she needs to try and work out how she's going to get out of this. Um, she's really fearful of the punishment that's going to ensue if she if this all gets out. Um, and we can see that Paris is getting more desperate. He moves from her, then resolved, so he's trying to control himself. Tell me, Abigail, and I pray you feel the weight of my truth upon you, for now my ministry is at stake, my ministry and perhaps your cousin's life. So his ministry first, then his cousin's life. Um, so when he, then um, he talks about, his, I guess, the, his experience, what it's been like, and, he, and so here, this quotation is quite important. Abigail, I have fought three here three long years to bend these stiff-necked people to me. So this quote, this quotation shows the gravity with which Paris views his position and it alludes to the ideas of power and of and reputation. Um, it alludes to the degree of authority that he thinks should accompany his position. And he's always feeling like people are undermining that. They, they, he's not appreciated. He's not given the authority that he deserves. He's less focused on spreading the word of God than on exploiting his position as a religious authority so that he can gain greater power in the community. Um, now, his reputation may be ruined, which means he'll be back to square one and have to rebuild the control he has worked so hard to acquire. So in a town like this, um, in order to keep your head um, and to to stay in a in a position of um, I get in some form of power and authority, you have to maintain um, all the appearances that go with that. Otherwise, people will turn on you. That's the impression that we get. And then he turns on Abigail and refers to her name. Your name in the town is it entirely? white is it not okay and I think he knows a lot more than what he's letting on here um, here we get more information about um, what's happened in the past um, you know why have you why were you discharged from Goody Proctor's service what happened and he's heard rumors uh, in the town about this and again we get uh, the impression of this town being full of gossips, full of rumours. Um, and, and Abigail is, is quite offended by that and she very, very adamantly says, my name is good in the village, I will not have it said my name is soiled. 
Goody Proctor is a gossiping liar. So the value of a person's name is a recurring topic in the crucible. Uh, reputation is so important to these characters because it's inextricably linked to respect and power in a highly interdependent community. Here, um, Abigail shifts the focus away from her own uh, reputation by trashing the reputation of Goody Proctor. That's a real um, persuasive device that she's using. She's deflecting and she's moving the blame from her onto someone else. If she can convince people that Goody Proctor is not to be trusted, then the rumours about her own sins will lose credibility. And, and now we are introduced to the Putnams. And here we have, um, interestingly, when they're talking about um, rumours and gossips, income and Putnam. And she is a twisted soul of 45, <laughs> a death-ridden woman haunted by dreams. Um, so the Putnams are presented to us as conniving and striving for control over others around them. They are proud and take pleasure in others' suffering. Uh, so make, make note of that, make note of, of how they influence the action. I really find it really uh, quite interesting when um, when Mrs. Putnam comes in and she's full of breath and she's shiny eyed and and later on she talks about how high did she fly how high um, so this this quotation is the first line heard from any of the Putnams um, thus automatically revealing Mrs. Putnam's immense happiness about the fact that Paris's daughter is sick and they have the chance to embarrass him um, everyone is so quick to jump on the witch band wagon. Um, it's really interesting to see. So we, we also feel like people have been waiting for this opportunity. It's on people's minds and they are acutely aware of how they can use situations like this to their own advantage. She, Mrs. Putnam, Putnam enters the room prepared to reveal, to revel, sorry, in Paris's distress about his sick daughter and attempts to make the situation more difficult um, by saying that even other members of society are associating what has happened to Betty with witchcraft. She's stirring the pot here. She says, uh, like, for example, when she says, um, Mr. Collins saw her going over uh, in a, Ingersoll's barn and come down light as a bird. Okay, so we can see how she's um, really stirring the pot uh, and meddling there. I also want to to make a reference to the fact that there's there's an obvious hierarchy in the town, um, and you have girls like um, Abigail and Mercy who who um, don't have a very sort of vague family uh, network, and and they are working for other people. Or Abigail was, uh, and so they are they seem to have a, a less of a um, strong and higher position than other children who are from who, uh, families who are of a higher status. So be aware of hierarchy, social hierarchy in this town. Okay, this uh, scene here really demonstrates to us the power of rumour and how this is really um, continues the action and really makes it spiral. Um, we also note this idea of they versus me. Um, there's this constant reference to them and they. Um, and so we have this sense of this collective, this, this group that seems to control and manipulate the town and the people in the town and it's always this uh, power of the the group and how that is used against the individual and it's really difficult for people to be individuals and to have a sense of self-expression people are not autonomous they cannot make decisions for themselves um, it's all about the group and this is a really big idea that um, is used in this that I think Arthur Miller is exploring. Uh, okay, so at this point in time, we have um, 
Mr. Putnam enters. Okay, so he comes in and again that adds to the, the action and it moves forward when we find out about their daughter being sick um, and, and so then they start bringing in really confidently ideas about witchcraft here. There is no, for them, there is no question. It's the devil's touch. And I can't believe you've not thought of this yourself, Paris. Um, and so here we're starting to get a sense of Paris's lack of control. And it's interesting to see how quickly um, that he's trying to control how to deal with this situation and how the information about Betty um, is is revealed and we see that he really cannot control that. Other people are meddling and taking over and pressuring him to tell everyone that it's witchcraft. Um, and and part of that is, you know, we see this, they say, um, all this, these reference to the collective, the people, the gossip. Um, he keeps, Paris keeps trying to stand his ground. I'm certain there be no element of witchcraft here and part of that's because he he thinks that he should have authority in the town and he thinks that people should listen and do what he says and so he could also be taking this stance because he wants people to do what he thinks and to follow what he's saying and not to be told by other people what to do so it could be a more of a sense of pride than anything else but either way, he's still giving a pretense of standing his ground here. And he keeps saying, I pray you not leap to witchcraft. Uh, we cannot leap to witchcraft, okay? And we already are aware of the irony here, okay? Uh, we, we already are seeing how we as an, as an audience know that he's called a parist. We know that he is leaping to witchcraft himself. And now we have the section where it gives us information on um, Thomas Putnam. Um, so you can, you would have read that yourself. Um, I would suggest that you pick out any phrases or words which define his character and that they're, you know, really quite helpful here. I want to talk about this part here. It is not surprising to find that so many accusations against people are in the handwriting of Thomas Putnam. Um, so here we see um, Mr. Putnam's vindictive nature. Um, we, we learn that he is constantly accusing others in court, most probably in order to raise his status in society, as after accusing others, he purchases the land that they leave behind. Um, and that is, is meant to, to make us feel really disgusted that these are people who, who are pretending to be um, a God-loving, Bible-believing Christian folk and they are behaving in a way that is completely in contradiction to what they are supposed to believe. Okay, let's move on. Um, it's interesting, I just want to make a point here about um, the people, the adults and their attitudes towards the children. They never seem to question what the girls say. They never seem to um, doubt it. They never seem to be, um, you know, dubious about the nature of this information. They are all eager to believe them uh, because they, there's this attitude, interestingly, that they still, you know, at this point they believe that children are innocent and vulnerable and weak um, and that they would never do something like this on purpose. Uh, so unlike me where if um, children were telling me something I naturally assume that whatever my children tell me is a lie and I have a, a natural mistrust of children um, but not the case here. So so I want you to, to see that and I want you to see that whenever um, one of the girls makes a claim and an accusation see how the adults respond and see how they they lap it up they are desperate to believe and they never once question the the truth and and there is this sense that um, a lot of what people say it's never tested it's never no one's asking for evidence it's all just conjecture but people speak about it as if it is actually fact 
Um, and, and interesting here we have we get information about uh, Mrs. Putnam and how um, she has um, secretly um, been calling on evil uh, of the of dead spirits. Um, and so that's quite an insight into um, what other people are doing and how they are dabbling in um, the dark arts. And there's a real sense that these people are superstitious. We also see that um, Anne Putnam is a desperate woman um, doing what she, she has been doing something that is considered to be quite sinful to conjure the dead. Um, but in a sense, it's interesting because she's not really accused of being a witch herself. Um, and so, so I would I see this section here as just really revealing the hypocrisy of the people of the town. Um, people are quick to see um, the spiritual world as the cause of a lot of their problems. They never really they don't have the knowledge, the medical knowledge to uh, to have an understanding of biological causes, um, psychological causes of things. So for them, it's a real ignorance and they would they would blame a lot of problems on the spiritual world. It's like when um, a lot of the um, traditions um, in, in Ireland um, and other places around England when if they had a child that um, was, I guess, really sick, um, if, if they had a child who had some form of physical abnormality or mental abnormality, they would they would see that that was because they are a changeling, that the fairies came and took their healthy baby and replaced it with an unhealthy one. And so instead of treating the child for the their biological problems, they would treat them as if they were um, a, a changeling and they would do all sorts of um, rites and rituals so that the fairies would replace the child again. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing that instead of um, reacting in a way that cares for the children and gives them what they actually need, um, they, they jump to superstition and they jump to this opportunity to accuse people of witchcraft. And for, mainly it's because they, they have ulterior motives. But as soon as the Putnams arrive, we see that this, this idea of witchcraft is really coming from them and they put that right to the fore and it's very hard for Paris to take charge, um, to take control back. Um, and, and that then at this point, he, he begins to believe it. Then you were conjuring spirits last night. And now we have the action intensifying again. Um, Abigail here says, not I, sir, Tituba and Ruth. Now I find this really interesting because Abigail's been quiet this whole time and she would be listening to their talk about witchcraft. Uh, and I think that she's worked out a way of how to get out of this problem. Um, and so she is now putting the blame on others. She's deflecting in order to save herself. And ultimately it's because fear is driving these people. We see that people are, are really motivated by fear and, um, and hysteria. Um, and, and so this then starts to, to increase um, as this part of the act continues on. Um, and obviously Paris then jumps to conclusions and, and bemoans the fact that, oh, now I've got a real problem on my hands. Um, and so he's again referring to his reputation and how he is now ruined. Um, and at this point we now have Mercy Lewis arrive on the scene. Now Mercy, like the Putnams, is conniving and also takes pleasure in others' distress. Um, when she's referred to as a fat, sly, merciless girl, it's giving us a really interesting description of her character and it creates the impression that she is much the Putnams um, whom she works for as she's also seen to be a character who revels in the distress that Paris is suffering through. Um, this is emphasised by the fact that she, though um, 
thought to see how Betty is, uh, making it seem as though she has specifically come to witness what is happening firsthand so that she can gossip about it later with her friends. Okay, um, and later on in this moment, he, Paris is convinced to um, go down to the crowd. So he says, all right, I'll lead them in a psalm. Um, and, and it's interesting because Putnam, he's constantly urging him to take action throughout this scene. Um, and Putnam, you know, and he, I guess there's this, you can see, you can always get this sense of tension between Putnam and Paris. They both want to be um, the men in charge. And so Putnam is using those directives and how he talks to Paris as well. Let you strike out against the devil and the village will bless you for it. Come down, speak to them, pray with them. Okay, see all those, those imperatives. They're thirsting for your word, mister. Surely you'll pray with them. Okay, that's a really interesting metaphor. Um, think about the, the effect of that word thirsting. What does this suggest about the people? Okay, there's great implications in that metaphor and I want you to sort of write down some ideas about that. Um, so he, despite the fact that Paris is persuaded to go down, he still says, but let you say nothing of witchcraft yet. I will not discuss it, okay? The cause is yet unknown. I have had enough contention since I came. I want no more. So he's still trying to be the one to be in charge here. Um, and so they leave, leaving the girls alone. Uh, Paris says, if she starts for the window, cry for me at once. Okay, so these, interesting because things like that suggest that she has a mentally unstable mind and that subtly is alluding to witchcraft. Uh, and it's um, reinforced again when he says there is terrible power in her arms today. So it's interesting because super strength was considered a sign of demonic possession. So it's obvious that these things are playing on his mind. Now in this part of the act, the girls are together and they're trying to find out what's going on. They're trying to get information. Um, they, they don't know a lot about what's going on. They have a real lack of knowledge. We are also um, exposed to firsthand to see Abigail's violence and the way that she treats people. She's really quite cruel. Um, and I think that she, she suspects that Betty is faking this entirely. Um, so she suspects it's this absolute pretense. Um, An interesting Mercy says to her, have you tried beating her? I gave Ruth a good one and it waked her for a minute. Here, let me have, let me have her. Um, the girls don't hold back at all at uh, being physical and it, and it makes us think and, and question what sort of community have these girls grown up in? What have they been exposed to to think that it's okay to treat people like this? Abigail is trying to take charge of the situation. Listen now, if they be questioning us, tell them we dance. I told him as much already. Um, this is, let's get our story straight. This is what you need to say. He already knows about Tichiba conjuring Ruth's sisters. Um, and then she tells Mercy that he saw you naked. So now we see that um, there actually, there's confirmation. There was someone naked and it was Mercy. Okay, which also makes us see that Abigail wasn't the only one doing all of these things. There were other girls involved as well. Now, Mary Warren, enters. She is portrayed as innocent, powerless and weak and tending to do as others tell her. Um, and that's reinforced in those stage notes. This section here, this quotation, um, is really 
foreshadowing her future actions as it provides a basis for why she acts the way she does throughout the play. She seems to do exactly what the others around her are telling her to do. When Abigail makes her join them in the court for the trial, she succumbs. When Proctor tells her to speak the truth, she once again does as he says and goes to the face to face the court. And then when Abigail puts her in a situation where she becomes powerless, she succumbs to pressure at once again. So she is weak. But she's also honest and she does have uh, that, that voice of conscience that she knows what the right thing to do is. Uh, she appeals to the girls to tell the truth. Um, but um, she could also just be incredibly fearful and motivated by fear rather than motivated by doing what is right. Um, that is, and that is conveyed through the way that she speaks, um, the questioning, what will we do, the exclamatory language, all indicate to us her fear. Um, and then the girls turn on her. She means to tell, I know it. Okay, so they all know that um, Mary Robin is a loose cannon and that they need to control her. Um, and, and this scene gives us um, more idea of um, the power and the violence that um, people use to control. So things like Mercy moving threateningly toward Mary. Um, when Abigail um, talks to Betty, she sits Betty up and furiously shakes her. I'll beat you, Betty. Okay. Um, so the way that people are using threats and violence to control. Um, and we see that um, increase in this part of the scene. Um, Betty comes to. Um, she's frightened of Abigail. And is it the fear of... Um, of, of Abigail, of what she could possibly do to her? Is it the fear of what she's been listening to this whole time? Um, we don't know, but she, she, she stirs and she comes to at this point. And again, this really um, increases the action. Um, and she accuses Abigail and um, we get more information. You drank blood, Abby. You didn't tell them that. Now, I find this comment really interesting because once one, um, one fact is that one reason why I find this interesting is that we get more information about what happened last night. And it's uh, again, it's information that puts Abigail in a worse light. So every little bit of information makes the situation worse and worse and worse. So she drank blood. Now, up until now, what we've heard doesn't sound that bad. Um, you know, it, it sounds like a typical situation of young, young girls, you know, experimenting and, and being a bit silly. You know, when girls sometimes do the, the seances and, you know, they, they're curious about these things and they try to, to see what happens. Um, and when we hear this information, you drank blood, this makes it look a lot more serious and a lot more um, intentional which is slightly different to what it was like beforehand. And it also, the second thing that it reveals to me is that Betty has been hearing this, all of the conversation uh, as she's been lying in bed, as she's pretending to be out, out of it, unconscious, um, any of those things. She has not been and she has been privy to the whole um, action and dialogue. So for me, that makes me see that she has been pretending this whole time and it's just because she's afraid of what's going to happen of getting into trouble that has caused her to behave in this way and then she then accuses her even more with you drank a charm to kill John Proctor's wife you drank a charm to kill Goody Proctor and then Abigail's response is to smash her across the face um, shut it now shut it um, and she doesn't seem to feel any, show any remorse about this violence that she inflicts on her cousin. She needs to take control. She is um, responding violently because that is the way that she can uh, keep power and control. Now we see this all heightened in her speech here. Now look you, all of you. 
Abigail threatens the other girls with violence if they dare to tell anyone that she tried to kill Goody Clock with her black magic. So this quotation, what Abigail says here, tells us that Abigail has experienced severe emotional trauma in the past that almost certainly affects her current mental state. It also gives us a taste of how far she's willing to go to achieve her desired outcome and exact revenge. So through violence and through threats, Abigail can control the other girls. This is the world that she knows and that's what she is, is going to do. So we see that through threats and violence, um, people do that to control, but it's often because they themselves are afraid. So we see, again, fear and how um, people are motivated by fear in this community. And also this, this scene um, indicates to us the world of secret and lies. Because people are, af are afraid and they live in fear, it um, enhances the um, dishonesty, enhances this idea of people putting on appearances to conceal the reality. And this, this action does the heart good. Okay, so we're going to continue on here. Um, the girls are hysterical at this point. They, they think that Abby, that, you know, that, um, that Betty's going to die. Um, Abigail is, it says here that she is starting the noose and then gets this lovely bit about putting it on her um, packer and jump on her. Um, and then at this point, in this sort of confused action, John Proctor walks in. And I, and I think this is a great um, device employed by Arthur Miller as well to see how that affects the tension, the rising action of this scene. All right, we're going to stop there. Uh, we will look at the next section, next lesson. Um, send me an email if you have any questions about this part of the act. Is this something that you want me to expand on? If I wasn't clear on some points, please let me know.